chapter 17 breathing and exchange of gases as you have read earlier oxygen is utilized by the organisms to indirectly break down nutrient molecules like glucose and to drive energy for performing various activities carbon dioxide which is harmful is also released during the above catabolic reaction it is therefore evident that O2 has to be continuously providing to the cells and CO2 produced by the cells have to be released out. This process of exchange of O2 from the atmosphere with CO2 produced by the cell is called breathing, commonly known as respiration. Place your hand on your chest. You can feel the chest moving up and down. You know that it is due to breathing. How do we breathe? The respiratory organ and the mechanism of breathing are described in the following section of this chapter. 17.1 Respiratory Organs Mechanism of breathing vary among different groups of animals depending mainly on their habitats and level of organization. Lower invertebrates like sponges, cilantrates, flatworms, etc. exchange O2 with CO2 by simple diffusion over their entire body surface. Earthworms use their moist cuticle and insect have a network of tubes, tracheal tubes, to transport atmospheric air within the body. A special vasculized structure called gills are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks, whereas vasculized back called lungs are used by the terrestrial forms for the exchange of gases. Among vertebrates, fish use gills where reptiles, birds, and mammals respire through lungs. Amphibians like frog can respire through their moist skin also. Mammals have a well-developed respiratory system. 17.1.1 Human Respiratory System We have a pair of external nostrils opening out above the eyes. It leads to a nasal chamber through the nasal passage. The nasal chamber opens into the pharynx, a portion of which is the common passage for food and air. The pharynx opens through the larynx region into the trachea. Larynx is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production and hence called the sound box. During swelling, glottis can be covered by the, a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis to prevent the entry of food into the larynx. Trachea is a straight tube extending up to the middle thoracic cavity which divides at the level of fifth thoracic vertebra into right and left primary bronchi. Each bronchi undergoes repeated division to form the secondary and tertiary bronchi and bronchioles ending up in very thin terminal bronchioles. The trachea, primary, secondary and tertiary bronchi and initial bronchioles are supported by incomplete cartilaginous rings. Each terminal bronchial gives rise to a number of very thin irregular walled and vascularized back like a structure called alveoli. The branching network of bronchi, bronchioles and alveoli comprise the lungs. 17.1 We have two lungs which are covered by a double layered pleura with pleural fluid between them. It reduces friction on the lung surface. The outer pleural membrane is in closed contact with the thoracic. Figure 17.1 Diagrammatic view of human respiratory system. Sectional view of the left lung is also shown. Lining whereas the inner pleura membrane is in contact with the lung surface, the part starting with the external nostrils up to the terminal bronchioles constitute the conducting part whereas the alveoli and thin ducts from the respiratory or exchange part of the respiratory system. Part starting with the external nostrils up to the terminal bronchioles constitute the conducting part, whereas the alveoli and their ducts form the respiratory or exchange part of the respiratory system. The conducting part transports the atmospheric air to the alveoli, clears it from foreign particles, humidifies, and also brings the air to body temperature. The exchange part is the site of actual diffusion of O2 and CO2 between blood and atmospheric air. The lungs are situated in the thoracic chamber which is anatomically an airtight chamber. The thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by the vertebral column, ventrally by the sternum, literally by the ribs, and on the lower side by dome-shaped diaphragm. Anatomical setup of lungs in thorax is such that any change in the volume of the thoracic cavity will be reflected in the lung pulmonary cavity.
such an arrangement is essential for breathing as we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume respiration involves the following steps first breathing in pulmonary ventilation by which atmospheric air is drawn in and co2 rich alveolar air is released out second diffusion of gases oxygen and co2 across alveolar membrane third transport of gases by the blood fourth diffusion of oxygen and co2 between blood and tissue utilization of oxygen by the cells for catabolic reaction and the resultant release of co2 cellular respiration as detailed in the chapter 14 17.2 mechanism of breathing breathing involves two stages in first inspiration inspiration during which atmospheric air is drawn in and second is expiration by which the alveolar air is released out the movement of the air into and out of the lungs is carried out by creating a pressure gradient between the lungs and the atmosphere inspiration can occur if the pressure within the lungs and intrapulmonary pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure that is there is a negative pressure in the lungs with respect to atmospheric pressure similarly expiration takes place when intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure from and are specialized cells of muscles external and internal intercostal between the ribs help in generation of such gradient inspiration is initiated by the contraction of diaphragm which increases the volume of thoracic chamber in the anterior posterior axis the contraction of external intercostal muscles lift up the ribs and the sternum causing an increase in the volume of the thoracic chamber in the dorso ventral axis the overall increase in the thoracic volume causes a similar increase in pulmonary volume an increase in pulmonary volume decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to less than the atmospheric pressure which forces the air from outside to move into the lungs that is inspiration figure 17.2a the relaxation of the diaphragm and their intercostal muscles returns the diaphragm and sternum to their normal position and reduces the thoracic volume and thereby the pulmonary volume leads to an increase in intrapulmonary pressure to slightly above the atmospheric pressure causing the expulsion of air from the lungs that is expiration figure 17.2b have the ability to increase the strength of inspiration and expiration with the help of additional muscles in the abdomen on an average a healthy human breathes 12 to 16 times per minute the volume of air involved in breathing movements can be estimated by using a spirometer which helps in clinical assessment of pulmonary functions 17.2.1 respiratory volumes and capacities first tidal volume tv volume of air inspired or expired during a normal respiration it is approx 500 ml that is a human healthy man can inspire or expire approximately 6000 to 8000 ml of air per minute inspiratory reserve volume irv additional volume of air a person can inspire by a forcible inspiration this averages 2500 ml to 300 ml expiratory reserve volume erv additional volume of air a person can expire by a forcible expiration this averages to 1000 ml to 1100 ml residual volume rv volume of air remaining in the lungs even after a forcible expiration this averages 1100 ml to 1200 ml by adding up a few respiratory volumes described one can derive various pulmonary capacities which can be used in clinical diagnosis first inspiratory capacity total volume of air a person can inspire after a normal expiration this includes tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume that is tv plus irv expiratory capacity ec total volume of air a person can expire after a normal inspiration this includes tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume that is tv plus erv third functional residual capacity 
FRC volume of air that will remain in the lungs after a normal expiration. This includes ERV plus RV. Fourth, vital capacity VC. The maximum volume of air a person can breathe in after a forced expiration. This includes ERV, TV and IRV or the maximum volume of air a person can breathe out after a forced inspiration. Fifth, the total lung capacity. Total volume of air accommodated in the lungs at the end of a forced inspiration. This includes RV, EV, TV and IRV or vital capacity plus residual volume. 17.3 Exchange of Gases Alveoli are the primary site of exchange of gases. Exchange of gases also occurs between blood and tissue, oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged in these sites by simple diffusion mainly based on pressure or concentration gradient. Solubility of the gases as well as the thickness of the membrane involves in diffusion are also some important factor that can affect the rate of diffusion. Pressure contributed by an individual gas in a mixture of gases is called partial pressure and is represented as PO2 for oxygen and PCO2 for carbon dioxide. Partial pressure of these two gases in the atmospheric air and the two sides of diffusion are given in table 17.1 and in figure 17.3. The data given in the table clearly indicates a concentration gradient for oxygen from alveoli to blood and blood to tissue similarly. Table 17.1 Partial pressure in MMHG of oxygen and carbon dioxide at different parts involved in diffusion in comparison to those in atmosphere. Respiratory gas oxygen pressure in atmospheric air is 159 MMHG and in alveoli this is 104 mmHg in blood deoxygenated is 40 mmHg in blood oxygenated it is 95 mmHg in tissue it is 40 mmHg respiratory gas CO2 in atmospheric air it is 0.3 mmHg in alveoli it is 40 mmHg and in deoxygenated blood is 45 mmHg in oxygenated blood is 40 mmHg and a tissue it is 45 mm of Hg. Figure 17.3 Diagrammatic representation of exchange of gases at the alveolus and the body tissue with blood and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. A gradient is present for CO2 in the opposite direction that is from tissue to blood and blood to alveoli as the solubility of CO2 is 20 to 25 times higher than that of Oxygen. The amount of CO2 that can diffuse through the diffusion membrane per unit difference in partial pressure is much higher compared to that of oxygen. The diffusion membrane is made up of three major layers, figure 17.4, namely the thin squamous epithelium of alveoli, the endothelium of alveolar capillaries, and the basement substance in between them. Its total thickness is much less than a millimeter. Therefore, all the factors in our body are favorable for diffusion of oxygen from alveoli to tissue that of CO2 from tissue to alveoli. Figure 17.4 A diagram of a section of an alveolus with a pulmonary capillary. 17.4 Transport of gases Blood is the medium of transport for oxygen and CO2. About 97% of oxygen is transported by RBC in the blood. The remaining 3% of oxygen is carried in a dissolved state through the plasma. Nearly 20-25% of CO2 is transported by RBCs. 70% of it is carried as bicarbonate. About 7% of CO2 is carried in a dissolved state through plasma. 17.4.1 Transport of Oxygen Hemoglobin is a red colored iron containing pigment present in RBC. Oxygen can bind with hemoglobin in a reversible manner to form oxyhemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry a maximum of 4 molecules of oxygen. Binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is primarily related to partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of CO2, hydrogen ion concentration and temperature. Other factors which are 
interfere with this binding. A sigmoid curve is obtained when percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is plotted against the PO2. This curve is called the oxygen dissociation curve, figure 17.5, and is highly useful in studying the effect of factors like PCO2, S plus ion concentration, etc. On binding of CO2 with hemoglobin and the alveoli, where there is high PO2, low PCO2, lesser S plus ion concentration, and lower temperature, the factors are all favorable for the formation of oxyhemoglobin. Whereas in the tissue where low PO2, high PCO2, and high H plus ion concentration and higher temperature exist, the conditions are favorable for dissociation of oxygen from the oxyhemoglobin. This clearly indicates that oxygen gets bound to hemoglobin in the lung surface and gets dissociated at the tissue. Every 100 ml of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 ml of oxygen to the tissue under normal physiological condition. 17.5 Oxygen Dissociation Curve 17.4.2 Transport of Carbon Dioxide CO2 is carried by hemoglobin as carbamino hemoglobin about 20-25%. This binding is related to the partial pressure of CO2. PO2 is a major factor which could affect this binding. When PCO2 is high and PO2 is less, as in the tissue, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs, whereas when the PCO2 is low and PO2 is high, as in the alveoli, dissociation of CO2 from carbamino hemoglobin takes place. That is, CO2 which is bound to hemoglobin from the tissue is delivered at the alveoli. RBC contains a very high concentration of the enzyme. Carbonic anhydrase and minute quantities of the same is present in the plasma too. The enzyme facilitates the following reaction in both directions. CO2 plus H2O in the presence of carbonic anhydrase formation of H2CO3 and that is converted into bicarbonate ion and H plus ion in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. At the tissue side where partial pressure of CO2 is higher due to catabolism, CO2 diffuses into blood, RBCs and plasma and forms SCO3- ion and H plus ion. At the alveolar side where PCO2 is low, the reaction proceeds in the opposite direction leading to the formation of CO2 and H2O. Thus, CO2 trapped as bicarbonate at the tissue level and transported to the alveoli is released out as CO2. Figure 17.4 Every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood delivers approximately 4 ml of CO2 to the alveoli. 17.5 Regulation of respiration Human beings have a significant ability to maintain and moderate the respiratory rhythm to suit the demands of the body tissues. This is done by the neural system or specialized center present in the middle region of the brain and respiratory rhythm center is primarily responsible for this regulation. Another center present in the pons region of the brain called pneumotaxic center can moderate the functions of the respiratory rhythm center. Neural signal from this center can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter the respiratory rate. A chemosensitive area is situated adjacent to the rhythm center, which is highly sensitive to CO2 and hydrogen ions. Increase in these substances can activate this center, which in turn can signal the rhythm center to make necessary adjustment in the respiratory process by which these substances can be eliminated. Receptors associated with aortic arch and carotid artery also can recognize changes in CO2 and H plus ion concentration and send necessary signals to the rhythm center for remedial action. The role of oxygen in the regulation of respiratory rhythm is quite insignificant. 17.6 Disorders of respiratory system First Asthma. Asthma is a difficulty in breathing causing wheezing due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles. Second, emphysema. Emphysema is a chronic disorder in which alveolar walls are damaged due to which respiratory surface is decreased. One of the major causes of this is cigarette smoking. Third, occupational respiratory disorder. Certain industries, especially those 
involving grinding or stone breaking so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of the body cannot fully cope with the situation long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis proliferation of fibre tissue and thus causing serious lung damage workers in such industries should wear protective masks summary cells utilize oxygen for metabolism and produce energy along with substances like carbon dioxide which is harmful animals have evolved different mechanisms for transport of oxygen to the cell and for the removal of carbon dioxide from there we have a well developed respiratory system comprising two lungs and associated air passages to perform this function first step in respiration is breathing by which atmospheric air is taken in inspiration and the alveolar air is released out expiration exchange of o2 and co2 between deoxygenated blood and alveoli transport of these gases throughout the body the exchange of o2 and co2 between the oxygenated blood and tissue and utilization of o2 by the cells cellular respiration are the other steps involved inspiration and expiration are carried out by creating pressure gradient between the atmosphere and the alveoli within the help of specialized muscles intercostals and diaphragm volume of air involved in these activities can be estimated with the help of spirometer and are of clinical significance the exchange of oxygen and co2 at the alveoli and tissue occurs by diffusion rate of diffusion is dependent on the partial pressure gradient of oxygen po2 and co2 their solubility as well as the thickness of diffusion surface these factor in our body fat facilitate diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli to the deoxygenated blood as well as from the oxygenated blood to the tissue the factor are favorable for the diffusion of co2 in the opposite direction that is from tissue to alveoli oxygen is transported mainly as oxyhemoglobin in the alveoli whereas po2 is higher oxygen gets bound to hemoglobin which is easily dissociated the tissue where po2 is low and pco2 and s plus ion concentration are high nearly 70% of carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate that is hco3 minus ion with the help of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase 20 to 25% of carbon dioxide is carried by hemoglobin s carbamino hemoglobin in the tissue where pco2 is high it get bound to blood whereas in the alveoli where po2 where pco2 is low and po2 is high it gets removed from the blood respiratory rhythm is maintained by respiratory center in the medulla region of brain pneumothoracic center in the pons region of the brain and a chemosensitive area in the medulla can alter respiratory mechanism the chapter is over thank you